Hi everyone, thank you for joining the virtual performance chapter. Sorry about the slightly late delay um, getting started. We had just a few technical difficulties, but we're already glad to see that you guys um, stayed around for this. A uh, quick introduction for um, our February meeting. Um, uh, just wanted to remind you, if you do have any technical issues, please feel free to uh, raise your hand. I will private chat you through you to you through the GoToWebinar chat window to help you. Um, just a reminder on that. Also, I just wanted to call out our sponsor, SolarWinds. They sponsor our virtual performance chapter. Um, they're very generous in allowing us to give out a gift card for every meeting, and so that will be announced later this week. Um, just a reminder, uh, if you are not currently a member of the PASS organization, to join lots of volunteer opportunities out there. Okay, straight to our speaker. So we have Pedro Lopes. He is a senior program manager from the Data Platform Group with Microsoft. He's here to talk about gems to help you troubleshoot query performance. Pedro, thank you very much for joining us, and it is all yours. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, hello, everyone. I would just like to start by making a brief request. If anyone has any question on what you're currently seeing on the screen at a given point in time, please raise your hand. Uh, Leslie, please make sure that I, I get the questions while they're in scope. Sure, uh, absolutely. That may mean that we may go a few minutes overboard. If we do, those that, are, that, that want to leave, obviously, feel free to do it. But I prefer to get questions that are relevant while still in scope. Okay. So again, thank you very much for, for sticking around almost uh, 10 minutes after the time. Um, I'm a program manager specifically with the Tiger team. Um, we own all of in-market versions of SQL Server, and specifically I'm more focused on the relational engine, which then uh, translates specifically to the query performance aspects of it. So this session has the same name as one I've delivered, I'd say, eight or nine months ago. The content is completely revamped, and it's, um, and it's pivoting more on the latest changes and enhancements we've done to tools and the engine to really give you gems to help you troubleshoot query performance. So the, my objective for the session is to show you the new diagnostic improvements we had, plus show you how we can use some of those to troubleshoot common performance issues. So um, I'm assuming that if you ask this, this question to, to yourself, you'll, you'll get a fairly different answer, but I'm sure everyone in the, in the audience right now has at one point in time, more recently or, or not, dealt with the query performance issue. And everyone that has either more or less skills, the point is when you get into, into, into a query performance issue, First, you need to make sure that you are handling actually with a query performance issue and not a performance issue coming from some, some other um, resource or aspect of SQL Server. And then you need to know how to scope it down to the problem, to the heavy hitter, and take it from there. So some fundamentals first. Why does a query slow down? Well, it slows down mainly because it has excessive resource consumption. And that uh, may be excessive CPU, excessive I.O., or excessive memory usage. Now, this is all driven by the optimizer, and the optimizer is driven by mainly by statistics, so metadata that exists in the engine about underlying um, uh, objects and the data distribution that exists in those objects as it relates to the predicates that we're using. So it may, it may well be that the, the workload has changed its profile somewhat, and you now have a poor indexing strategy in place for that change in the workload. It may be that you have, that you're lacking useful statistics. Maybe you don't have auto stats on and, and you don't have some relevant statistics or um, depending on the version of the engine, you can even uh, make use of multi-column statistics and those might not be available. Let's say your data grew exponentially and it grew to a point where it just tipped over in terms of performance and you actually need to start thinking about having partitioning. Uh, it can be the consequence of not necessarily excessive resource consumption, but rather block queries that are blocking each other, so the resource consumption is rather low, but you have a large blocking chain. And, and this is more rare, it can, have, can be something to do with incorrect server configurations. I mean, you can have 
uh, you can have set a low memory configuration or uh, lower max UB, and that introduces complications in parts of the workload. This is more rare, but it's, it's still there in, in the equation. So essentially, you need to get the, the context for whatever you are analyzing in terms of a slow running query. Uh, is the performance related to a component other than the query itself? For instance, do I have slow network performance? And that's why my users are complaining about a slow app. But I'm going to SQL Server and actually it's running fine. If so, that's probably not a slow running query issue. Um, is, if, if it is, and if I can determine that, is it related to one query specific that I can map to an application component, for instance? Or is it a set of queries? And can I go in and look? If the query was optimized with useful statistics or not, actually we are we are we are working towards this. Um, do I have any suitable indexes available? Were they used? Um, do I have a large volume of data that I'm bringing in? And if so, can I think about partitioning it? Or um, did I even give the query optimizer enough leeway to come up with a way to optimize a complex query? Maybe I have a query that has 10 joins, 15 joins, and it has a very wide predicate, and maybe I'm not giving, uh, I'm not writing the, the best uh, query, so to speak, that, that the query optimizer can optimize in a, in a small amount of time, and maybe I should think about rewriting the query, breaking, down, breaking it down into um, smaller result sets that I join at the end. I mean, there are a number of, of uh, possibilities here. So, Pedro, so how do I, quick, yes. quick question. As you mentioned about partitioning, somebody had a question, will partitioning improve the query performance or is it more of a storage optimization? Great question. So it can. If you are, um, if you are, if you have part of, of your predicate has, is a natural key, meaning you choose as a partitioning key something that is natural key, that is naturally a predicate in your queries, then that means that we can do partition segment. We can do partition elimination, which means that we'll be able to focus uh, only on the partitions that uh, address that predicate. So yes, it can have a very specific uh, uh, impact on query performance in that aspect. That was a good question. Okay, so. Some of the tools that we use nowadays, even us here, that when, when a customer comes to us and says, I have a, uh, a query performance issue. Now, we need to go and look at show plans, so the actual execution plan. Uh, we have a ton of, of uh, changes and enhancement in, the, in this aspect. Uh, we've been blogging about it for, for the last few months. There's obviously query store available nowadays, and we'll show you how we can leverage that with, in, in conjunction with the plan comparison tool, something that we've released as part of SSMS uh, back in, in uh, late to, uh, 2015, uh, and I'm going to show you how you can, you can leverage that to get some added insights. Live query stats, uh, it's been there, available since, um, mm -hmm. since SQL 2014. Is that a question? Nope. Nope. Sorry. sorry. Um, it's been there since SQL Server 2014. Um, I'm going to show you how we actually improve the usability of live query stats here. And obviously, there is the question of X events. No, I won't be using Profiler. Um, let's, let's try to forget Profiler as much as we can. And this is not something I'm going to dwell on today. So, and a bit of, uh, still a bit on the fundamentals. Why, why do I pivot so much on show plan? Well, the query plan includes mostly, if not everything, I need to know about what happened and why is the query performance uh, bad? Uh, it, it shows me if it has to do something with the query design, I mean, and with the, with the query tree. Um, how data is accessed? How is it joined with other data? What is the sequence of those joins and those other operations? Um, am, am I using parallelism or not? Do I have runtime warnings as well as, as, as uh, compile warnings? Um, I'm getting also the actual execution stats which give me a lot of information about is there a disconnect or a skew between estimations and actual, um, actual resource users in terms of the number of rows that are coming through, flowing through the operators. And also a lot of information about hardware and resource stats. Everything you see here is inside show plan. And again, in the, in the sense SQL 2014 service spec 2, even more so in SQL 2016 SP1, we've added a lot of useful information to make Showplan a one-stop uh, shop for, 
for um, getting all of these insights. But we'll get there. So first I want also to, to and this is the, I promise the last part of the fundamentals, also uh, provide a little bit of uh, insight as to uh, how queries relate to query plans. So we have this notion of query fingerprint, and this is especially useful when you start uh, growing your, your, own, your own scripts or you leverage some of the scripts out there, including those that are on, on our GitHub, uh, to get um, a snapshot or a quick insight as to what's happening in your system. Uh, as, it, as it relates to queries and their respective query plans. So the notion of query fingerprint is actually a query hash. And this is um, something that explicitly identifies a specific query text within the, the plan cache or within the, the, within the caches. So you can use the query hash as something to filter on in, for example, CZM exec requests and CZM exec query stats which hold performance stats for all the queries that run in your system. So it's especially useful to do some, um, some uh, point in time analysis, if you will, about the trend of, of, of a specific query. Now, we also have the notion of SQL handle. This is basically a token that uh, identifies a SQL text that relates to a specific batch. So if you send a multi-statement, uh, you run a stop procedure, or you send a multi-statement, um, you're running a multi-statement uh, script that is a batch, and then we break it down into, into specific statements, and each statement has a specific handle. Now, you can, again, you can use this uh, with the function CZMXX SQL text. You can also run this uh, as a predicate in CZMXX query stats, and also the, the, the in CZMXX query memory grants. Very useful, this last one, for you to understand proactively by going into that, that DMV. If you have uh, queries that have uh, were granted much more memory than they actually used during execution. This is especially useful because it is one measure of the ability or lack thereof your system to run queries concurrently. Let's say I have uh, 10 gigabytes in my system and uh, all my queries are, are, are very poor estimations and that leads to um, having huge memory grants. Let's say just to get a wrong number, one gig each. That means that at one point in time, I can only run at a max, and that this is, again, thinking I have enough schedulers and workers, I can only run a max of 10 queries um, virtually at the same time, given that I don't have enough memory to even grant uh, memory required for other queries to run. So having a, it's very important to think about query grants and make sure that we are as much as possible uh, the number of the, the, the number shown in the granted memory is as close as possible to the used memory. That is a, a measurement of how accurate uh, our, our resource uses was in terms of memory and therefore our estimations. So but quick question, Pedro. Yes. yes. Um, will the available memory on the system have any impact on the memory grant? The, the, the system, you mean the underlying operating system? I believe so. No, so um, the the memory grants are for for a query to execute are in the scope of the process memory. So as long as you don't, uh, as long as you haven't reached the max server memory, which can it does not account for all memory consumers, but but most of them, and the the memory grants are set within the scope of max uh, server memory, then as I was saying, as long as you haven't reached that, that, that ceiling, if you will, um, you, you're fine. And if you have a lot more memory in the system, then I would say it seems that you may need more memory to run SQL Server. You need to expand it. I don't know if that addressed the question. I believe so. He can ask another question. If not, thanks. Okay. Uh, so the, the, there's also the notion of query plan fingerprints. So similarly, there's a query plan hash. And uh, as, as its counterpart for the query text, you can use this query plan hash to determine uh, queries that share, for example, the same execution plan. So for, a same, for the same query hash, you can have more than one plan, depending, for instance, if, let's say, I'm executing a, a statement uh, from my session, and someone else is opening their own session, and let's say in SMS, they have a different number of set options that actually change execution context, let's say, uh, a read a abort on or off. Uh, this sets another execution context and therefore I can have um, a different plan actually that maps to the same uh, query hash. 
So I, if I have one query hash with more than one query when hash cached, this may be may, may be may be telling me that I have such such a, a scenario. And for instance, it can be useful to understand if this is happening. If let's say the session that the application is running, which someone is complaining is very slow, and and uh, they get plan A, and I go in with my SMS and I say, oh no, query is running fine. But then I go in and I actually see that I have different set options for my session as it relates to the session the, the uh, application was running. And that may, be, may give me some clues and some insight as to what may, I may need to change on my side to test with the same settings the application is using, just to make sure that I'm running into the same problem that I can then troubleshoot. Again, um, you can use this with CZMXEC requests, CZMXEC query stats. And finally, the notion of plan handle. So this is, a, again, a token that is given at runtime for a cache execution plan, uh, sorry, at compile time, and you can use this with the DMVs you see on the screen. So now that we get this in, because we, we, you'll see a lot of screens out there, uh, scripts, sorry, that do make use of this to, to make sure that, that apples connect to apples. So let's look at some of the diagnostic and troubleshooting enhancements we've been doing. So one relates directly to what I was just explaining. The pain of joining information from DMVs with X event collections. It is, it's been a pain that's been there for some time that people collect X event sessions and then they collect the query hash, the query plan hash action in X events and they go in and try to get the, the, uh, the plan from cache as it relates to, let's say, the query plan hash they have in the X event session. And guess what? It doesn't match. Now, uh, this is a problem that's been in Connect for some time, and actually there was someone from CSS, I think two or three years ago, that actually wrote a CLR session, uh, the, sorry, a CLR um, function that actually tries to do that translation, uh, but we actually now fix that in the engine. So the problem is the query hash and the query plan hash in X event was not the same data type as the, their respective columns in the DMVs, like CZM exec requests and we could not correlate the information. Now, in SQL 2016 RPM and 2014 SP2, we added, so we, we could not rewrite the existing actions. Those may be used, may already be in use. So our policy is to um, don't break existing usage. And in this case, what we've done is we added two new actions, which uh, with a suffix signed, as you can see on the screen, query hash signed and query plan hash signed. And those will be, the same ones that you recognize in the DMVs. So therefore, if you're collecting an X event trace uh, and you want to connect to the DMVs later to get some added insight, just start using this new underscore sign instead of the previous ones to, to, to reach that, that uh, objective. Okay. So another, another topic we've been hearing a lot, and it, actually we also suffer from that ourselves in the sense that we need to um, go in and, and analyze queries is, the amount of round trips you need to collect additional information. Someone sends you uh, an actual execution plan, but then you don't have enough context information. Let's say, were trace flags enabled in the system uh, that may be changing the execution context? Uh, what memory did I have available? Um, what were, what, what was the information about, uh, if I'm using parameters, what's the data type of those parameters? I mean, there are a number of uh, context information that is very relevant for me to do proper query analysis, and I need to go back and say, hey, collect the data from DMV A, B, or C, um, and, and give me that data so I can get enough context to do proper query analysis. Well, we've been doing a lot of work to avoid some of these round trips. And so the problem space began with, I'm missing performance insights on query plan nodes when I'm opening up a actual execution plan. To some degree, and you'll see some improvements also there, even when I'm seeing the, the, um, the estimated execution plan, I may be missing some insights that could already give me some actionables. So something we've, we've, um, we've done is we added per operator performance statistics for nodes and threads. And this all boils down to a, a, um, a property or in, in the show plan, which is runtime counters per thread. Now, you can see in this table how up until SQL Server 2016, so if you're running 2014, 2014 SP1, 2012, whatever, if you, if you will go and look at the actual plan you have, let's say you 
click on a scan or seek, whatever. Here's the information you had until then. You had the actual rows, you have the actual end of scans if you were doing scans, and you have the actual execution, so the number of times that that operator oh. executed. That's it. Can you still hear me? Because I saw, I heard the noise there. Uh, yeah, you're fine. I'm not sure what okay. that background was. Sure. Okay. So you have very, uh, very little uh, context information there. It didn't really give you a lot. So again, what did you do? Well, you went back to, uh, oh, please run the same query, getting the plan again, but make sure you set statistics IO on and set statistics time on so I can get more insight again. Well, in SQL Server 2016, and we backported this to 2014 SP2, as you can see in the column in the middle, we added a lot more information, context information, on how that specific operator executed. So now you have the actual elapsed time um, that the operator took in milliseconds. You have the actual CPU time it took, uh, it, it, it uh, spent. You have the number of logical reads, physical reads. You have information about the actual rows read. This is something we're going to pivot on a little bit later. So you have a more, lot more context information to, uh, that prevents some round trips to go back and collect this information and allows you to have in, in the same uh, scope, a lot of context on which you can understand how that operator performed. Now, in SQL 2016 SP1, we added this three new um, operation, three new properties, sorry. The input memory grant, the output memory grant, and the use memory grant. These three apply, um, and you will see them in the scope of um, hash operations, so hash matches and hash aggregations, but also in the context of, of sorts. Again, to give you added information about the memory use of, of these sometimes memory-hungry operators. Now, these last three are not yet exposed as such in, um, in SSMS, although if you right-click a plan, you go into Show uh, Execution Plan XML, you'll see them, uh, see the three properties there. Oh, and by the way, just one short note. When you look up a tree, let's say you're starting from um, a seek and a scan, and you're then joining, joining uh, them both, um, you will see these runtime counters on each of the child operators, and also you'll see them in the, in the parent, which is the join here. Now, the join will have a cumulative value for the children. So, let's, in essence, I'm saying that uh, if I'm seeing that uh, one, one operator took um, uh, made 10 logical reads and the other made 10 logical reads. In the join, I will see at least 20 logical reads because it's a sum of the of the underlying uh, operators. Plus, uh, if we had an ash and it spilled, we'll have additional um, IOs from 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 that operator itself. Um, the point is, these are cumulative values when you're running uh, row mode operators. Um, but if you are running batch mode operators like uh, column store scans we actually don't trickle up that value. We have singleton values uh, just for the scope of that batch operator, and that has to do with the way we track uh, performance inside the engine in this aspect. Okay, so here's how you actually see all that information when you look at a plan. You see on the right uh, how runtime information exists inside the plan XML, and you see all the information there, and you're seeing on the left how it looks like when in this case I was selecting, I was selecting a cluster index scan, and what information I can see there in terms of I/O. For instance, all those, all of these new uh, properties are exposed here, as you can see. Plus, I'm also seeing information per thread. Obviously, uh, if I'm running a single threaded or max UP one, I'll only have one of these. But if I'm running a, in this case, a cluster index scan in parallel, I can see how many rows. Flow, uh, have flown through a specific thread that was running that in the scope of this class of the next scan. For instance, I can see that there is a somewhat important gap in the, between the lowest, uh, the thread that, that retrieved the least rows and the most rows. What do I see from here immediately? Well, this query from the get-go uh, was, was uh, adding, piling up CX packet weights. Because clearly this one ended much uh, much sooner than, than the thread number one, in the sense that thread number one retrieved 40,000 rows and thread number two retrieved 17,000. 
It can also be something that I can go back and look at my statistics. Or is the sample appropriate as it relates to my data distribution? Because if it were a proper sample, uh, then I would potentially not see such a large skew between threads. In the sense that if I have very accurate statistics, it's more than probable that this scan would, more, would have a more even distribution between the threads in terms of data reads. So th this already gives me some insight into, the, into that perspective. Plus, I have here the actual elapsed CPU time and the actual elapsed time that this operator took. Again, this goes, to, this goes in, into, into the space that I may not need, I may not need any more to, to collect, oh sorry, to collect set statistics time and set statistics IO. Because now I have that information right here in the plan. So one last round trip. If someone collected the actual execution plan and sent to you, you don't need to go back and say, hey, sorry, you forgot to set statistics IO and set statistics time on, because you have that information right here, where it actually matters in the scope of what you're analyzing. We also added a new extended event, query thread profile. This is a debug channel uh, extended event. So if you choose to use it, uh, please make sure that you look in the debug channel. And it has the same information that we were seeing. Uh, one caveat here is that while in show plan, the time for CPU and elapsed time is shown in milliseconds, here, and again, that's part of the, the uh, field name, you see that it's in microseconds. And again, that has to do with the way X events are collected versus show plan. Quick question, Pedro. Yes. Um, somebody has an application that uses JDBC and was wondering if it's possible via JDBC to get the show plan XML for the query that was ex just executed. Remotely, you mean? I would assume so. Uh, well, the problem, the, 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 the point here is uh, if you're running a remote query, you'll see a remote query operator, and we cannot really get uh, much information about what's happening on the other side. Thank you. Um, but feel free to be offline if you have additional questions on this. Okay. Uh, thread zero shows zero number of records. Is it because it's the control thread? Exactly that. Okay. Perfect. If you look at CCM exec requests, you will also see a similar behavior where for a par parallel query, you won't see the I.O. being, or the, 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 yeah, the I.O. and even the rows being incremented there. Um, you'll need to look in the, um, in the uh, tasks, CCM exec tasks, to, to be able to see what the tests are doing. So yes, that's exactly why, why it's showing zero. Good question. Okay, and there's one more. Do you need to enable some options to see actual I.O. stats in the plan? I am running a query on SQL Server Service Pack 1 using latest SSMS, but I don't see those attributes. So, if you are running this on, uh, if you are running this on, um, sorry, on SQL Server 2014 SP2 or SQL 2016 RTM even, you will already see these attributes in the show plan. Now, depending on SSMS version, you may not see them as you see the screenshot here. This screenshot is actually from the latest gold version, so the latest uh, RTM version of SSMS that was released uh, a few weeks back. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, you will see that information inside the, the XML. So if you open the XML, I'm sure you'll see the information there. If it's an actual execution plan and you've collected at least with 2016 RTM and, and, uh, or 2014 SP2 and up, but you will not see them in SSMS. You will see the S in SSMS if you have the proper SSMS version, which in this case, any of the V17RCs or the, one of the two latest uh, gold bits of, um, of SSMS V16, uh, you'll see this information there. Okay? At the very least, make sure that you are seeing that you're seeing the runtime information node in the show plan XML because it's there. And no, you don't have to enable anything specific to get that information there, other than collect the actual execution plan, because those are runtime, uh, that's runtime information. Okay. Okay. Yes, was that another question? Yes, just one more. Uh, yes. Do you recommend filtered indexes to give more specific cardinality coverage, um, in parentheses, and 200 step limits? Excellent question. Uh, the short answer would be yes. The long answer would be uh, something that you, you, you need to be very cognizant of how you can miss a filtered index. 
uh, if your predicate changes somewhat or is, is incremented and therefore it may be, that scenario may be permeable to you missing those filtered indexes. You'll actually have a warning in show plan with that um, because the, the filtered index could not be used and therefore what you think you were implementing as a, 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 as a way to overcome, let's say, uh, the 200 step um, uh, topics that you were mentioning, uh, it can also be detrimental if you're not having the predicates that can actually use the filter index. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Good. So, uh, more information we've added to show plan. Trace flags. What trace flags existed at compile time and at runtime? Again, super important to understand uh, if, I'm, if I'm analyzing a query, what is in play in the system that may affect query performance to begin with, it may affect how the query optimizer actually shapes my plan. So we have, it's very useful to understand this in the context of, of a, a query plan. Again, you would need to go back and ask someone to, to, to dump um, the VCC trace uh, command for you to understand what trace flags were running in the system. Well, not anymore. You can see we have two sections here. We have the trace flags that were present at compile time, meaning the, the, the trace flags that are impacting how the query is compiled, and I have three here. Uh, and from this list, which ones actually had an impact in compilation itself? So basically think of it as the first list is all the trace flags that were uh, um, in the system, running in the system when the query com was compiled. The, the bottom two are the ones that did not have a, a impact in query compilation. So if I look at this, I'd say only 9481 actually had an impact on compilation. And why? Well, in this case, 9481 is forcing the OC, so naturally it has impact in compilation. Um, 2371 has to do with, with uh, statistics up, up the threshold, and 7412 is something I'm going to discuss next. Uh, it's now a documented uh, trace flag. It's something we've introduced only in service pack one, and I'm going to uh, talk about it in a, in a little while. So, just FYI, uh, we have an, uh, we we have compiled a list of all the um, documented trace flags that were previously scattered in several KBs and other sources uh, into the master trace flag uh, page in Books Online, and you can use this short URL. That's just easier to remember. Okay, carrying on. Something else we added to show plan, information about wait stats. Wait stats that were in play in the session that was executing the query in the given point in time where I collected the plan. Again, I don't need to go and more or less guess from the stats, uh, from the wait stats collection I've done on the side and try to match, oh, so this plan was collected at 11.54 a.m. in next seconds, and here's the wait stats that were in play in the system at that time, but hang on, that we had to do with session, I don't know what, that's just too complex, right? So we've got that information now inside show plan. Again, this is runtime information, so you, you'll only see it in an actual execution plan, but you'll see it there. You'll see what the, the, this specific query uh, waited on when it was executing. Okay? So again, a lot of more context information that allows you to have some more insight as you are analyzing the query performance. It may not necessarily have to do with query design or the plan shape, uh, and it may have to do something with the weights. So let's say I was seeing some kind of weight here that was uh, related to, to some other aspect of the system. So it's very important to have this in, in consideration. Um, something else that was a very old connect item we've uh, introduced into show plan. We now, allow, we now show the parameter data types. You're running your store procedure, your parameterized query. You had information about the parameter runtime value. But you're actually seeing some sort of implicit conversion, for instance. Well, you, obviously you can go back into, into the scripted table you have or go back to someone and say, hey, give me access to the database or script out the table because I want to see the data types because I'm seeing an implicit conversion here to some data type that I already have information, but I don't know the source. I don't know what was the, the data type to begin with. Well, it's just here now. Uh, so that, again, it's adding context and it's removing round trips to get the information we need 
in order to do um, to do query plot analysis. In this case, it just makes it easier to detect type conversion issues. But we're not we're not finished yet. We have also information about the query query times, if you will, CPU time and elapsed time. Now we've seen a few slides back how we now have that information regarding operators, but we needed that information also about the whole the, the entire query execution, right? So this is what is also now exposed. We have the CPU time and elapsed time it took for the entire query to execute. So this is information that is present in the select node or the root node in, in your <coughs> excuse me on your plan. So again, you have the information you need to understand how much time it took and how many, much CPU it took to execute in your production environment if that plan was captured from there. More information. You have information about the resource governor. Um, we've listed a number of resource governor settings under the um, optimizer hardware dependent um, node inside show plan. In this case, you see max compile memory. So this shows me the max memory available for the optimizer during compile. So essentially it tells me what is the max memory setting for a specific resource governor pool, resource pool, um, and, and it can may give me an insight on whether um, on what amount of memory I have to execute my queries or not. So instead of the entire server memory, I may be bound to a specific resource pool that someone, uh, through the classify function, someone is binding this execution to some resource pool that has less memory. We also added the max uh, memory, max query memory, and this shows you the setting of max memory percent hint that someone may have configured in the resource pool that you're ex executing on. So if this is if you're not if you're not using resource governor, essentially you are running in the in the default resource pool, and this will show you the max uh, memory available under the, the the default resource pool. Okay. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this demo. Although I will um, give you the script to to play with it yourself. Um, we have how much time left, Leslie? Even with the uh, delay. Absolutely. I think we can go for another ten minutes. Okay, so I'll still skip this demo because there's something else I, I'd like to show you instead. Um, okay, and you can play this later yourselves. So here's what you let's let's move on to memory grants. We really pivot a lot on this because the amount of memory that a query is granted to execute versus what it used, it's really something that's really relevant for you to understand the amount of concurrency you can have in the system and the amount of waste or lack of waste that you have in terms of memory, which is such a precious resource when you're running queries. So this warning that you see here is actually available since SQL 2012, and it already gives you a, a lot of insight. It's not easy to actually uh, repro this in, in, in every environment, but it, this is the only warning you had since SQL 2012 about something less than right with a memory uh, grant issue, which is, A, uh, before this query executed, I had to wait 40 seconds for memory to be granted. Now this can have a number of, 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 of underlying issues. It can be that I actually am running into a system that has less memory than, than it needs to execute all the incoming uh, batch requests. And therefore, because maybe all the running batch requests have huge memory grants, I don't have enough memory to grant to another query to execute. So how oh, sorry, you have to wait until I have enough memory for you to <coughs> for you to be granted and then start execution. So no query will execute if the min memory grant for that query, as it was estimated, is granted. Um, um, so it doesn't start execution without a grant. So in this case, um, I can tell you that the, the, the runtime of the query was 42 seconds. Well, I just got a warning that said I had to wait 40 of those 42 seconds just waiting for memory execution, for memory grant. But now, how do I get more insight into that? So in CSDM exec query stats, we've added all these columns that, together with the information you already had in CSDM exec query stats, allow you to have a more historical slash trend-like trend view of how your query is executed. Again, CSDM exec query stats is something that you will uh, filter with a query hash uh, so you can filter through 
your, your, the query you're, you're trying to look for. Um, and as you can see here, you now have a lot of information about um, memory grants. What was the max memory grant that, that this specific query had? What is the min? I mean, in the, the screen right now, the values are the same because I just ran once as soon as the server started. But as the, that query is executed more often, even if the plans change and that leads to different um, grants, you will see the numbers changing here. So it's a good measurement of how memory was used by your, your, by your query. In this case specifically, I can see that the last grant for this query was almost 800 megs, and I didn't even use one kilobyte at runtime. Now that doesn't seem to be a good use of memory. This would definitely be a candidate in which I go back and try to understand, hey, did I have skewed statistics? Did I have skewed estimations? Because something led to um, uh, the system estimating that you would need 800 meg to execute this, and it, DM, it even, even took one kilobyte. Okay? So again, going back into these DMVs, doing some analysis allows you to at least pinpoint or scope out the heavy hitters you need to take a look at. And we also added that information to show plan. I've so shown you this before in the previous um, in the previous uh, slide. How that information is also exposed in, in, in show plan per thread and per iterator. So, question, Pedro. Yes. Is it possible to create some alerts based on the warning for wait on memory grant execution? Um, I'm not sure I got the question. Uh, can you create an alert based on? Um, wait on memory grant execution. So this here, if you're talking about this, uh, this will show up as if you, even if you're doing a trace, if you if you're collecting X events, this will be an execution warning. The category is named execution underscore warning. It, that that already exists. So if you're capturing a, a trace and you're capturing the errors and warnings uh, type of events. The one that says execution warning, it's related, to, related solely to this. Execution warning means memory grants weighted. Okay, excellent. Um, and one other question, and yes. you might need to help, help me interpret this. Is there now some fairness count so that BigQuery memory requirements can still get a turn? Other words, may get kept out of play for ages. I'm not sure I fully understand that one. Uh, I'm not sure I do either. Uh, you can either ping me offline. Uh, if you're talking about the, if you're talking about the memory gateways in which a query, depending on the memory it needs, it will have to clear through in order to get to execution. Um, we've actually made extensive changes to that, the gateway model in uh, 2016. And if you go to the Tiger blog. Uh, my colleague Ajay has written an extensive uh, blog on that. Plus, we also have a new DMV, uh, which um, it's also there in the blog. It's not in books online yet. We'll, we'll get to that very soon. Uh, but it's a new DMV that allows you to understand if um, queries needed to clear through those uh, gateways. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So more in terms of warnings. Again. This is all about giving you the max possible context when you're collecting an actual execution plan for you to understand what was happening in the system. So in SQL Server 2014 SP2 and 2016 SP1, we've added one new warning that has to do uh, with memory grants. And this has three conditions. The one you see on the screen right now, if you can see in the, in the bottom uh, left, is that this... Uh, so the query memory grant that detected an excessive grant condition, and you have there the description of what an excessive grant is, uh, which may impact reliability. Yes, well, the point is if you have a very large grant and in the end you used very few of that, very little memory of that grant, that means that you are A, wasting memory, B, hurting concurrency, and therefore the reliability in terms of performance reliability of your system. In this case, I can see that the grant initial size was almost 300 max, but the query actually, uh, in the end, just used 176K. Now, imagine if, it's, if most of your workload has a, a similar profile. You're wasting a ton of memory with that hurting your concurrency. And although you already have this information in the system, and you actually, this information was already in show plan, but it was not exposed as warnings. And that's what we've done here. 
Uh, the other two conditions, use more than granted and grant increase, only apply to um, also don't they don't apply to row mode operators, only to batch mode operators, because batch mode operators cannot spill. So because they would lose performance otherwise. So we it's the only exception where we allow an operator to go over the initial grant. Okay. Moving, moving forward, so we also added a new X event to detect this sort of situation. In this case, the, 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 the X event is only fired when the grant is at minimum 5 megs. Otherwise, it would be too chatty, so we don't really fire this X event. So again, this is very useful if you're collecting an X event trace um, for some period of time and you want to know if this is happening or not. So to be able to at least administratively control a scenario like the one you've seen of excessive grants, in, 20, in SQL Server 2016 and 14 SP2, we added two new hints that allow you to administratively limit the memory grant. Uh, so at least it provides, if you think a scenario like the ones I was showing, you, you can, um, before you even go in and start uh, trying to rewrite the query, look at other aspects, you can simply limit the memory grant. So, there's a, this new hint is max uh, grant percent here. It's a it's a um, it's a floating point value, uh, which means that you can set a 0.1 percent of memory. There's a rule that uh, the valid uh, the valid values need to be between zero and 100 percent, and obviously the max grant percent needs to be at least equal, if not uh, bigger than min grant percent. Um, yeah, and the, the point of floating point is, is this, obviously if you are in a one terabyte machine, which is not that uncommon nowadays, it's starting not to be uncommon, uh, if we only allowed 1% uh, as the minimum, that, that would already be too much. Uh, how can I use this? Let's, if, I, if I look back to the query I, I just had on the screen, the, let's say for the sake of, of simple arithmetic, I had a one gigabyte server here, and I can see the grant memory size is 300 megs almost, and I, I could see consistently that was the behavior for this query. Well, I could add, before I do anything else, just to make sure I don't hurt concurrency in this aspect, I could add the mean grant, or the max grant percent equals, um, what, 0 0.2 of the one gig, that will still be higher than the 176 I took here, and if you look at the DMV averages, you can even compute an average from there, and at least administratively limit the wasted memory in this aspect. Okay? So, uh, again, I'm going to skip this demo. I'm going to focus only on the last demo I have for today, uh, but again, I'll provide you all the scripts. Um, we need to talk about Leslie in the end, how, how I can provide all the scripts for the folks to be able to, to do this. Yep, absolutely. So, uh, in terms of warnings, we've also extended existing warnings. Oh, so, as you can see on the left, up until SQL Server 2016, let's say you were running a sort and the sort spilled. This is the information you had. This operator used tempdb during execution with spill level 1. Well, spill level 1 just means I needed one uh, run through the incoming data set to be able to sort. Um, nothing else. Well, how do I understand what resources it used. I couldn't get that. Maybe I could make some sense of it by, by dumping set statistics IO and trying to understand what would be the most probable um, work table there, but that's it. Now I can have actual information on the context of this sort, as you can see on the right there, uh, in SQL 20 service, in SQL Server 2016 RTM and 2014 SP2. I now know how many threads were used to execute this sort, uh, how many pages it wrote to TempDB, and what was the uh, memory used for this for this uh, spill? So very very useful information when I'm doing this troubleshooting. Similarly for a hash, this uh, on the left you have the information you had up until SQL Server 2016. You know that this hash match, this inner join, uh, used TempDB with spill data during execution with spill level one. Spill level one means I didn't need to do hash partitioning to, to, do the, uh, to do the hash spill, but that's it. No more information. Look again to the, um, to the right. I now know how many pages it wrote, how many threads it spilled on, how much memory was, was in play here. So a lot of useful information in this aspect. With F, we, as, as usual, we have the corresponding X events. If you're running a, an X event trace and you want to capture these events, 
Uh, we've now expanded those events. You can see on the top what you had up until 2016, and in the bottom what you have in the newer versions. Uh, much, of, much, of, much of the same information we just saw for show plan. Same for sort warning. Okay, so let's get into another problem space. <coughs> Detecting predicate search inefficiencies. Well, let me try to translate this. When you look at a plan and you look at the actual number of rows, those are the rows returned after the predicates are applied. That means that when I look at a scan or a seek, I know the actual number of rows after whatever was a seek predicate uh, was applied there. But that may not be the actual number of rows that were scanned in the underlying table or index. So this is a scenario that's usually hidden in an actual execution plan. You look at a seek or a scan that returns only 10 rows. Why am I looking at such a large I.O.? I would capture a statistics I.O. before I even had that information here in show plan, and that would show me that I was doing 10,000 reads to retrieve 10 rows. What's up with that? Or I would see very high CPU coming from that query, but then it has a very simple or somewhat simple um, plan shape, and I see very few rows uh, flowing through. So what's up with that? Uh, again, this is about removing round trips to get additional information. So what, what can you do? Let me try to very visually explain this, what, what it means um, for a, a search over a table uh, without any sort of predicate enhancement. Or in this case, what I'm talking about is the, the predicate push down. So let's say I have this sales or the detail table uh, in, in, uh, in my adventure works database, and I issue this query. So I can see here I have two predicates over the same table, and one is where the modified date is X and Z, and uh, where the order quantity uh, is larger or equal to, to 10. Um, what I do first with this index seek is actually do a range scan, because the seek is actually using um, the seek predicate over the modified date. So I get all that result set. But then I'm still missing the order quantity, right? So the actual rows coming out of the index seek will be whatever um, matches the range scan. But then I need to apply a filter. And the filter goes, goes as a new operator to filter out. So that's the residual predicate from the seek. will filter out the order quantity, which is even a smaller uh, result set, which then gives me the actual rows coming out of the filter. And therefore, my result set will be the one I'm seeing on the screen. So this can be inefficient. This is saying I'm not searching from the get-go using all possible predicates in the underlying table read. So therefore, I'm doing more reads than I actually need to in a, in a, in a, in a perfect scenario. Now, here's what's happening when, we, when the engine is able to properly push down all the predicates. I have the same table. I have the same query. Now, with this, I actually can do a range scan that the output of the range scan and the actual uh, data that was read is already equal to my predicates, both my predicates. I was able to push down both uh, predicates to the, the, the storage engine, and therefore the actual rows uh, are just the ones I needed, and therefore I saved the filter operator there. Now, what does this do? At the very least, it saves you CPU because a filter takes just CPU time. Um, at, at, if used properly, you can actually be just reading the exact amount of data you require. But how can you know if you're hitting one scenario or the other? So this is where I would do a small demo. Uh, I think, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that. How much time do we have? Uh, five minutes? Yeah, about five to ten minutes. That's up to you. Well, I can I can speak about it all day. <laughs> I just <laughs> like to be talking about, okay, about how people that You've are only got eight. <laughs> Okay, so let me do a very quick quick demo on this one, uh, just to show you what I mean by by this. Um, yeah, let me push this one. So hopefully everyone can see my screen properly. Um, let me just do some quick setup here. Yes, I would need to be in the right database. Uh, should be this one. Okay, already 
things this is good. Now let me make sure I clean up everything. Okay. Here's something. Um, so by the way, this stress flag is undocumented. Don't use it in the production environment. Uh, don't use it anywhere. This is actually turning off uh, because it's very it's very difficult to prevent SQL Server from optimizing um, optimizing the predicate pushdown. So this stress flag actually disables predicate pushdown. You don't want to do that. You want predicate pushdown as often as possible. Okay, just the the caveat here. So if I run this without uh, predicate pushdown. Let me also get the actual execution plan. Here's what I get. Uh, in this case, I actually don't have any data. I think it's because I need to change my predicates here. No. Is it further behind? Oh, come on. Come on, what happened? So the demo got a lot of me. Oh, come on. Okay, let me show you something else. Um, let me show you um, how it works when I do predicate pushdown properly or not. And again, I need to be in the right database, which is Adventure Works in this case. Okay. So let's look at the actual execution plan for both of this. In the first one, we can see, so we can see an index seek on both, right? Uh, Let's try to do some more close analysis on this one. In the first, I have a last name which has a, 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 a wild card here, and the first name is John, and the result set is only two uh, Johns with S something in the last name. If I look at the index seek, and if I look closer, I see that the actual number of rows is two for all threads, and the estimated number of rows is 14, um, look at the estimated number of rows to be read. So the estimation said it would have to read 2,000 rows in order to do this seek. Why? Well, I'm pushing down a, a predicate and I'm doing a range scan. So I already have the information that the uh, optimizer estimated to read a lot more than it actually uh, expected to retrieve from there. That's already an insight I can get even from the estimated execution plan. But if I go here, we'll see that we actually, yeah, we actually read 2,100 uh, rows, so very close to the estimations, to just retrieve two, right? And that's because the, the pushdown predicate was not um, being used efficiently by this, by this index. If you look here, these, these are the C predicates. As you can see, first name equals S, and the, the uh, last name is uh, smaller than T. Uh, so it, it went back to the, um, to the underlying statistic that is relevant here, and it, it understood that uh, these are the steps in the histogram that match, and these, these are my estimations. Now, look at the second one. If you look at the second one, the predicate is similar in the sense that it's constructed in the same way. But if you look, let me just make sure I'm in the right place. Okay. If you look at the at IO, let me, let me look here. Okay. Estimated number of rows to be read, 35. Estimated number of rows, 35. So it was estimated that it will only need to read exactly what you do need to retrieve. Let's actually look at the number of rows read. We read 14 rows. What's the, um, the actual number of rows? 14. So here's a clear example of how proper indexing for the um, predicate I'm using allowed SQL Server to do prop a very scoped uh, read over the, the index and allowed me to read only the data, retrieve only the rows I actually needed for my output. Now, if I look at the plans, they both are index seeks, but I need to look at these details. And now they're exposed here, and they were not before. So what is exposed that's new? You'll see in the screen. Uh, let me go. You'll see that we now have the estimated number of rows to be read, and we now have the actual uh, the number of rows that were oh, sorry the number of rows that were read. So you can compare at uh, at um, 
compile time, how many rows you are estimated to, to, re to read in operator X, and how many are estimated to come out. So this is, this is part of the cache plan, so therefore you can do proactive cache analysis. And at runtime, you have this information. So this allows you to see if you're using predicate pushdown efficiently in all essence. Okay. Um, now, just to conclude our, our presentation here, I'm trying to, to go as quick as possible. Um, this is something that's happening right now somewhere in the world. A DBA gets, gets a call, my application is slow. Every finger is pointed at him. You need to go and fix whatever is wrong with this. Now, the DBA, poor DBA, gets out all his toolbox. He gets out PSS Diag. He runs his X event traces that he had previously uh, cooked into, into a, a sample session. He breaks out Profiler eventually. He breaks out all, all the tools he needs to collect data. The point is these tools collect data after the fact. And then you need to take the data, take it to another system, repro it, analyze the data, understand where mitigations can be, can be um, enacted, and then deploy the mitigation. All of this while your boss or someone is very frustrated asking you to solve the problem uh, quickly. Now, what if you could do live query troubleshooting? Now, there's an inherent problem to doing this. Uh, to have in-flight query execution statistics, which is the name we give it, uh, uh, an, an infrastructure needs to be enabled on demand. And this is a, quite a mouthful. It's a query execution statistics profile infrastructure. Now, what is the problem with this? The, the, it's, very, it's very useful to be able to tap into a running execution, see where the hotspot is, and be able to do some live query troubleshooting in a production system. But by enabling that infrastructure, we, and we've tested this, I'm going to show you numbers next, uh, the cost overhead of running this infrastructure all the time, even if it allows you to do live query troubleshooting, it's that the cost can go up to 75%. So if you're running into a bad situation, it makes it worse. This is obviously why a lot of customers still revert back to the previous pattern of, I won't run this all the time, I'd rather get um, the, my data collections and then analyze on the side, and this all takes time. And with that, it, it's adding to frustration of the users that are using the system. So, and there's lightweight profiling. This is something we've um, unleashed, I think that's the right word, in, in 2016 SP1. And if you look at the same uh, kind of uh, problem space, there's an alert, my application is slow, everyone is pointing to the DBA. But now, the DBA is able to tap in, into in-flight executions, find the hotspot, and deploy the mitigation. But how? How did we avoid those 75% um, uh, overhead. Now, I have some hidden slides here you'll get later uh, that explain how to enable this infrastructure and whatnot. Uh, but, but for now, just keep in mind that if you remember one uh, trace flag I was using in, in the beginning of the session, 7412, that actually enables the new lightweight profiling infrastructure that has, as you can see here, by, as measured by a TPC-like workload, a max overhead of 1.5 to 2%. Now, what does this mean? This means that in, in every system that you're running that is not already bound by CPU, where those 1.5 to 2 percent would really have its toll, if you can uh, accommodate the cost of having an additional 1.5 to 2 percent um, overhead in your in your workload, which I think is very reasonable, uh, as as opposed to the 75 percent of the uh, legacy, what you now call the legacy profiling infrastructure, then you can run this infrastructure all the time. What does it allow you to do? I'm going to do a 30-second demo here just to show you what it, what it allows you and why, why we, we can make DBAs to save the day in this regard. So I'm going to run some, some workload here. And I'm the DBA. I just got a call. Uh, everything's on fire. My boss is kind of pissed, saying, hey, you need to fix this uh, quickly. Let's say I like to use my um, activity monitor, for instance. Let me go to activity monitor. And let it fire up. And let's say I'm going here to expensive queries to find whatever is uh, making my system wait. Or why are the, the users so frustrated? Uh, okay, so I get this. I can right click, show live execution plan. And here it is. I'm seeing 
the execution plan as it is executing. Oh, I'm doing a cluster Linux scan here. Uh, okay. Uh, what else is running in the system? Oh, maybe, what is this here? Let me write, okay. Um, hold on Oh, this one, sorry. Let me right click, show live execution plan. Oh my god, look at these estimations here. I'm going to take forever to run this. This cluster index scan is taking 27 rows out of, I can't even read this number. So, maybe this query will never end, who knows. Um, so, how can you get insight into this? Well, I'm seeing the operators here with the actual I.O. Let's look at a, a index scan, for instance. I'm looking right here at the estimations, at the current um, number of rows. I'm looking at the table cardinality. I'm looking at the a number of re relevant information as the query is executing. I can also do this. I can go back and see who the hell wrote this query because if I look at the statement, it's something that is, let me copy this, open a new session. It's ginormous, okay? Oh, hang on, someone doesn't seem to trust the new C. Uh, let me see if actually this runs better or worse. We're talking about a lot of joins here um, with non sargable predicates because I have all these functions right here. Uh, let me enable the actual execution plan, run this. Obviously, I need to be in the right database, otherwise it doesn't work. Oh, come on, cooperate with me. And, oh, hang on, it's done. And the other query, look, it's still executing. Okay, let me look at the query plan. Oh, it's actually not parallel anymore. I have a serial plan, that means that I have a cost that it's low enough for it to be serial, and it's done. So, I've, I'm, because I have this very low overhead in running these query profiling infrastructure all the time, I was able to tap into a running execution rather than taking it on the side to another system, or even here, but then I would need, if it's an update, for instance, with a WHERE clause, I would, I would not be able to run the update on another session, so I need to really tap into what's happening in production, and running this infrastructure all the time with that very, very small overhead that you are enabling by, for example, uh, running DBCC, uh, sorry, running uh, 7412 trace flag all the time, which I, by the way, recommend if your system is not already bound by CPU, it unleashes this. You can go into production, do live troubleshooting. In this case, I was able to very simply uh, correct this by removing some, um, some uh, hint that my developers uh, somewhat, somewhat needed to use there. Okay, so um, I think we're out of time, right? We've expanded all that is reasonable. We have done um, a good job. I wanted, yes. I just wanted to leave you with this. Um, I didn't get the chance to show you the, the plan comparison tool. Um, I'm sorry about this. Just to let you know that in the current release of SSMS v16, we've added multi-statement show plan comparison there. Uh, we also added, uh, for all query store um, uh, reports, we've added the ability to filter by the number of different plans. Let's say I only want you to report on plans that have more than two different plans in query store so I can uh, further look at those uh, differences. The next few releases of Query Store of SMS, namely the current re release candidate for V17, already has two new reports, as you can see highlighted on the screen, uh, that, are, that have a lot of insight. For instance, if you want to know which queries exist that you force plans for, it was very cumbersome to find that. It's now right here with a new report. And we also added something that is new that I'll, I'll demo in a future session, query analysis scenarios, the ability to do self-troubleshooting um, with some um, in intelligence that will detect patterns in your query plan and try to provide you with, with, um, with actionables out of that. Okay? So, uh, yeah, I would show the demo, but again, we don't have really time for that. So, thank you very much. These are the bookmarks I would like to leave you with some blogs, our GitHub, we have a lot of scripts there that make use of a ton of things we saw today. Um, there's BP check also that does a, like a health check to your system. We have a number of resources you can, you can go and use. So thank you very much for sticking around this much time and I uh, hope it was useful and uh, feel free to ping me if you need uh, anything else.
Thank you, Pedro. That was excellent. Lots of good stuff. It's very exciting. Um, everyone, thanks for your patience as we got started a little late today. Um, hope you got some good information out there. We will have this recorded and on the VPC website, YouTube. Um, within a week, uh, we will also have um, anything that Pedro would like to send over to us, we can post it on our website. So thank you very much for joining. Have a good day, Pedro. Thank you. Thank you very much.